Hello again, Physics 20s. In today's lesson, we are going to continue to look at applications of resonance, although this time around, we're going to focus on resonance in air columns, as opposed to looking at a string, which was our primary object of focus in the previous lesson. So we're just going to continue to look at acoustic resonance. Now, to do that, we need to talk a lot about sound in terms of properties of sound and how we can create a standing wave in sound and what are different objects that we can use that can produce a standing wave in air. So first of all, let's define what kind of a wave a, a, a sound is. Sound is a longitudinal wave. And I can use this illustration to kind of show how this works. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw a few particles in the air. So let's say we have like particle, here's one, here's two, here's three, here's four. I'm just going to draw four particles in a straight line. Now what somebody's doing is that could be like a guitar string. So someone is just like flicking that string or strumming it or whatever the correct word is for that. Uh, and when the person hits that string, what it's going to do is it's going to knock into an air particle that's right beside it. So it's going to cause one of these air particles to hit, and it's going to start to vibrate back and forth. When that guy vibrates back and forth, it'll collide with its neighbor, and it causes this guy to vibrate back and forth. And then collides with its neighbor, causes it to vibrate back and forth, and so on. So the reason this is a longitudinal wave is because, well, first of all, the direction of energy transfer is away from the string so that would be towards the right in the situation and the direction of particle vibration in the medium and our medium is air is left and right so the direction of particle vibration and the direction of wave propagation are parallel therefore sound is a longitudinal wave now we're going to look at three different properties of actually more than three different properties uh, of sound starting with loudness The loudness of sound depends on the amplitude. So if a sound wave has a larger amplitude, then we're going to per perceive that sound as being louder. I suppose the way you could think about it is the, the greater the amplitude you have, the greater the energy that's being carried, and the greater energy you carry, that's going to translate to uh, a louder sound. Pitch. Pitch is our brain's interpretation of frequency of a sound wave. Now, I, again, I don't know how, like, how, I suppose different people have different uh, exposures to musical instruments. Uh, again, like I played the piano and it, I mean, I, I think a piano is one of the more easy instruments to visualize. So a piano has a bunch of different uh, keys on it. There's like the white keys and there's the black keys. So each one of those individual keys on a piano is going to produce a sound wave with a different frequency. And it's our brain's way of interpreting that frequency that we refer to as pitch. So I'm going to give uh, a couple of examples of some musical notes. So middle C, this is usually like your reference key when you're looking at a piano. It should like be roughly in like the middle of the actual piano. Middle C has a frequency of 261.6 hertz. So what that means is if your piano is nicely tuned and you hit that key, when you hit that key, a hammer is going to strike a string. And when that string vibrates, it's going to emit sound with a frequency of 261.6 hertz. If you go to the right of middle C, uh, and again, the, the way it kind of works is... Uh, so if you start at middle C and you start going keys towards the right, uh, the next white key would be a D. Then you would have E. Then you would have F. Then you would have G. And then you would have A. And then B. And then you repeat again. You go through like one complete scale. So middle C has a frequency of 261.6 hertz. Uh, you've probably heard of like the do, re, mi, fa, sol, li, ta, do. Is that how it goes? Okay, well, that's pretty much just 
starting at middle C and going upwards in terms of musical or in terms of pitch. So the do on that scale, that would be a representation of the middle C. So you'd have like do, re would be the D, mi, fa, so, li, how do you spell, how do you spell li? I'll say L-E. Do, re, mi, fa, so, li, ta, is it ta, do? Who knows? Okay, so middle C would be the do sound. The A above middle C, that should be that li sound and that do, re, mi, fa, so, li, ta, do. Okay, now I'm gonna actually use a computer program to generate these musical notes. Okay, so this is obviously it's not gonna <clears throat> it's not gonna sound the same like it would if you're playing it on a guitar or a piano because it's a it's an electronic program. But let's see what it, it sounds like here. Okay, so let's go to this program. It's called Audacity, by the way. Okay, so I'm gonna generate a tone, and I'm gonna pick the frequency of this tone to be middle C. So that's 261.6 hertz. Okay, so when I play this, the middle sheet C should kind of have like that do sound. Okay, sure. Sounds about right to me. I'll say that's do. And let's do that, let's do that A, that A key to the right of middle C. So we're, we're starting to go to a higher frequency now. So a higher frequency key. So let's go generate tone. And then I'll change this to 440 hertz. Okay, so this is a higher pitch sound or a higher key in comparison to the middle C. And that's supposed to be the, I think what, do, re, mi, fa, so, li. Yeah, the li, the li type sound, okay? It has a higher pitch than do, the do sound. Okay, so let's go back here. All right, so that's loudness, that's pitch. And we'll talk about something a little more complicated called quality. Now, I've already pointed this out. So there's a big difference between if you play middle C on the Audacity program compared to if you hit middle C on a piano, compared to if you played middle C in a guitar string, even though I'm generating the same frequency of sound, they just, they just don't sound the same. Like a middle C on the piano and a middle C in a guitar and a middle C in a computer program just don't sound quite identical. Okay, so sound quality is all about this. So sound quality explains why the same note played on a piano or the same note played on a guitar do not sound the same. Now, in terms of what the sound quality depends on, this is a little bit trickier. So it depends on two things. It depends on one, the number of distinguishable harmonics. So a harmonic, again, is if you have like your first harmonic that like going back to the string, first harmonic was your first, uh, your fundamental frequency or your first resonance frequency where you had one loop. And then your second harmonic was, uh, the second resonance frequency where you had two loops. So the quality depends something on the harmonics and it also depends on the amplitude of these harmonics. Yeah, I'm gonna give an example and I'm, I'm gonna just use some illustrations that just like they're, they're, they're by no means accurate, but hopefully they're just gonna illustrate the point. So I said, when a string is plucked, I wanna say strummed, but I just, I, I keep, I, that word keeps coming back to me, but I, I feel like it's wrong. Okay, when a strick is plucked or, uh, plucked or struck, uh, there are actually multiple resonance frequencies occurring at various amplitudes. Okay, so here's what I mean by this. So like if you actually take a string and you like strum it, I'm gonna use strum, I don't care if it's wrong or not, I'm gonna use strum, okay? You, you, if you take that string and you strum it, now it's starting to sound weird. Uh, instead of just getting one loop, you actually get a bunch of loops at the same time, okay? So if you look right here, uh, you actually have a, a couple of loops on the string. So I have this one big one, okay? The one single loop on the outside. Maybe I'll just illustrate this with the pens here following along a bit better. Okay, so I have this big one on the outside. Now this big one on the outside for a string, that would be N equals one. So that'd be your first harmonic. And then, at the same time, when you 
pluck that string. I've given up on the word strum. I'm just going to say pluck. You also get the second resonance frequency. So that's n equals two because you have two loops there. So when I uh, pluck that string, I actually get a couple of resonance frequencies occurring at the same time. Now, th this, for example, could be for, I don't know, th this could be like a guitar, okay? So this could be like guitar string. This is me attempting to play the middle C, okay? So that's what my string would look like. Let's look at instrument two. Mostly this is a piano. So again, what, uh, for a piano, you have a hammer that's hitting a string. Now for this one, there's actually a bunch of, uh, there's, there's actually more resonance frequencies here. So you have like the big one on the outside. So that's the single loop. So single loop for a string would mean that's the fundamental frequency. And you also have uh, this guy. So that's two loops. So that would be N equals two. And then you have a third one here. Let's go with this color. Okay, that third one, you have four loops, so that would be n is equal to four. So my apologies, you can't see that. Okay, so even though I attempted to play the same note on a guitar and we'll say this is a piano, it's the middle C. They don't quite sound the same. So the reason is your quality depends on your number of harmonics, and their amplitudes. So for instrument number one, you have two harmonics, okay? You have N equals one, you have N equals two. So my guitar, when I tried to play middle C, gave me two harmonics, each with a specific amplitude. And then uh, for instrument two, when I tried to play middle C, I actually got three harmonics. So I have three resonance frequencies that are occurring at the exact same time. So since I have a different number of resonance frequencies that are occurring simultaneously for my piano compared to my guitar, and the amplitudes of all these different harmonics are different. That's what makes it sound a little bit different. Again, clearly like, yeah, they do have that do sound to it, whether it's a guitar or whether it's a piano. But again, when you play middle C in a guitar or a piano, it's not the same sound. Otherwise, like what would be the point of having an orchestra if like every single instrument would play an identical sound? They, they have different sound quality based on their number of distinguishable harmonics and their amplitudes. A fourth property of sound, the speed of sound and air. Uh, we're going to use a pretty basic model to calculate this. So the speed of sound and air is temperature dependent. And we can calculate it using the following equation. So this is one that I believe I do provide on the additional formula sheet, which tells us V is equal to 331 plus 0 0.6 times T. In this equation, T is the air temperature in degrees Celsius. And V is a speed of sound and air in meters per second. The 331 and the 0.6 would just be a constant and some other kind of numerical coefficient. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about the units. That each of those would have their own units, but they'd be kind of like they'd be kind of like funky. I shouldn't say funky. Like the 331 here would have units of meters per second. But if temperature is going to be in degrees Celsius, then the 0.6 would actually have to have units of meters per second times degrees celsius because then they would cancel off okay but we're not going to worry about units when using this equation uh i think pretty standard speed of sound and air uh, if you're looking at like close to like room temperature is somewhere around like 343 meters per second so in one second sound can travel about 343 meters so that's like a third of a kilometer in uh in one second fifth property Beats. Beats is going to be interpreted as a pulsating sound that results from the interference of two or more sound waves at different frequencies. Okay, so to generate beats, I need two sound waves and they must be at different frequencies. And the interference of 
the two waves is going to lead to this lead to this beat type sound. To calculate the number of beats generated per second, we can use the following equation. So we have number of beats is equal to the absolute value of F1 minus F2. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to that Audacity program uh, in a moment, and just we're gonna we're gonna like listen for like what the the beats actually sound like. So uh, let's make up some numbers here. So I'm gonna say let's make F1 440 hertz, and then let's say F2 is 442 hertz. If you find the difference between them, F1 minus F2, take the absolute value, that would tell you that you're going to generate two beats per second. Okay, let's see what this sounds like. So I'm going to use these two values when I go back to the Audacity program, see if we can hear the two beats per second. Okay, so let's keep that and let's go here. Okay, so let's generate, let's get rid of this one. Uh, and let's generate a tone and... Uh, was it 440 I wanted? Yeah, 440. Okay, so I already got that one. It's a 440. And let's generate another one. Actually, actually, I want to draw a comparison right now. So let's just listen uh, what it sounds like if you just have one, uh, if, if you're just generating sound with one frequency. Okay, you can hear the, how the sound is kind of like continuous. It keeps going like, mm, with like no break in the actual sound. Okay, this is gonna be different now compared to uh, when I have two, a second tone, okay? So I have a sound wave with 440 hertz, hertz, I have a sound wave with 442 hertz, and what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna play this, and these two waves are gonna, they're gonna overlap, they're gonna interfere, and I'm gonna hear, instead of like that continuous do sound, I'm gonna hear like it broken up a little bit. And I should hear these little tiny like gaps in the, the, the gaps in the sound. You, you kind of hear that goes, instead of going like do, it goes like do, hoo, 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 hoo. I, I sound like I'm, I'm ridiculous right now, but you can actually hear the beats. So I'll kind of point out like, uh, like where we're hearing like the two beats per second. So it's like. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, etc. Okay. So that would be uh, two beats per second. Now I'm going to get rid of the second tone, the 442 one. And let's go back here. And I'm going to change this slightly. So I'm now going to do this again, but I'm just going to change the frequency of the other sound wave. So this time around, we'll do is we will go. F1 is keep it at 440 hertz. We'll do F2 at 444 hertz. And then the difference between those two would be four. So in one second, I should hear four of those pulsating beat type sounds. Okay, so. Let's go back to the Audacity program. Okay, so I'm going to generate now a tone, and this time we're going to do 444. So if I hear four beats per second, I should hear a lot more of those pulses in one second now. And I do. It's like one, two, three, four, 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 etc. Okay. So that's all a beat is. It's it's a. Uh, let's go back to the PowerPoint. So yeah, a pulsating sound that results from the interference of two or more sound waves at different frequencies. I mean, you calculate it just by figuring out the difference between the frequencies. Now, in terms of why this happens, well, let's say we have one sound wave at a frequency of F1. So this is a wave front diagram where I'm showing the, the crests of the actual wave. And let's say we have a second sound wave that is at a frequency that is lower okay I don't, I don't see the i don't see the wave fronts occurring as frequently so that the, it's good they're a bit more spaced out okay now if you look on the actual so we're going to look at when these two guys overlap so if these two guys overlap and you have a crest meets a crest that is a spot where you have constructive interference so in the in the pulsating beat sound that's where you'd hear like the sound max out at 
Okay, so that's the loud sound. The spot where you have a crest means nothing. So nothing on a wavefront diagram would, could just be interpreted as a trough. Well, they would cancel off. So the sound dies off. So the reason you're hearing that beat sound where it goes like woo, 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 where it like dies off for a moment, that's because that's points where there's destructive interference for between the two waves, as opposed to the constructive interference is when the two of them uh, the two of them add together to give you that really loud sound. Now we're going to apply this to a closed air column. I, I suppose a good example of a device that ha that that does consist of closed air columns, I believe, is a pipe organ. Okay, now let me explain uh, the, the the picture here. Okay, so this object is a tuning fork. If you take a tuning fork and you just like strike it with a hammer, it will emit sound at a, at a particular frequency. Okay, so it's going to emit a constant frequency. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm taking the tuning fork and I'm putting it over top of what I'm calling an air column. Now, what a closed air column is, is basically, think of like a cylinder, like a graduated cylinder if you want to. You have like a cylinder where one end is closed and the other end is open. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to strike this tuning fork. It's going to produce a sound wave. And this tuning fork, the sound wave, the wave energy is going to propagate so that it goes into the tube. It's going to hit this boundary and then it's going to reflect back. And the interference between the instant wave from the tuning fork and the reflected one is going to create a standing wave. And again, just to quickly remind you of what that's like, so let's keep this and let's go to here. Okay, so uh, think of it like this. On the left-hand side here, I have my tuning fork and I strike it. And I'm, I'm looking at the sound wave going inside of my tube and the fixed boundary here would just represent the bottom of the tube. So my instant wave, is going to hit this. This isn't, this isn't a perfect analogy just because uh, this is a transverse wave and sound is a longitudinal one, but it's okay. It kind of gives you an idea of how you can just at least visualize what the standing wave might look like. <clears throat> okay, let's wait for it to properly overlap. So the sound from the tuning fork hits the boundary. That's the red wave. It bounces back. That is the reflected wave. And it's the interference of these two guys is actually going to produce a, uh, a standing wave inside of my air column. Okay, so a standing wave, again, is you have these fixed points called nodes. And between the nodes, you just have vibration between an anti-node uh, anti crest to an anti-node trough. Okay, so going back to this illustration, let's kind of just get rid of the text here because it's getting a little bit messy. Uh, that's okay. Okay, so what we're going to show in here, and again, I know that sound is not a transverse wave, but we're just going to model the standing wave as if it is a transverse wave. Okay, now, we can look at, we can take this air column and we can cut it to different lengths. What I want to do is I want the open end of the tube to be cut in a way so that an anti-node hits the open end of the tube. So again, if you're trying to visualize what the standing wave looks like, uh, so let's do this. Let's draw like kind of like a rest position vertically. So that would be, be my rest position for the standing wave. And then we'd have our nodes. So our nodes are points that are not moving with respect to the actual, with respect to the equilibrium position. And then we have our anti-nodes. So your anti-nodes would be these points of maximum vibration where you're oscillating between a crest and a trough, oscillating between a crest and a trough. So this would be an antinode. 
this would be an antinode. Now, if you cut the tube blank so that an antinode is at the very top of the tube, you're going to hear a really, really loud sound. So when you actually put the tuning fork over, you strike it, it sends this instant wave in, there's a reflected wave, they overlap, interfere, produce a standing wave. You're going to get this super loud sound if you cut the tube to a length where an antinode is at the, at the very top. Again, an antinode is a spot where you have maximum amplification. Well, what's maximum amplification for sound? It's loudness. So if your antinode is at the very top of the tube, you're going to hear a very distinct loud sound. And we call that, we're going to call that a resonance position sound. Now I've shown you where the first three resonance positions are for a closed air column. So the first one would be where you have a quarter of a wavelength within the length of the tube. The second one would be where you have three quarters of a wavelength within the length. And the third resonance position, so the third time you can get this, this really loud sound at the opening, would be where you have five-fourths of the, the wavelength. Okay, let's summarize a, th a few things first. So a closed air column is, well, first of all, it's closed at one end and it's open at another. But specifically, you have a node at the closed end and you have an anti-node at the open end. If you can get an anti-node at the open end, then we get this really, really loud sound. And we, we refer to that as a resonance position. So a resonance position would be the column length, the resonance column length L, that is going to result in me getting a super loud sound. Okay, that's a resonance position. Now, we, we could actually just like draw pictures and figure out where all the different resonance positions are, but we can mathematically calculate this also. So we have our resonance column length would be equal to 2n minus 1 times lambda over 4, and that is for a closed air column. And again, you can just quickly plug a number in and just confirm this if it does work. So if n equals 1, so that would be your first resonance position. So that would be the shortest uh, column length that would result in you getting the really, really loud sounds. So that would be L is equal to 2 times 1 minus 1 times lambda, all divided by 4. 2 times 1 is 1, so that would just be equal to lambda over 4. Okay, so the N values here just represent the resonance position that you're looking at. And as you go to higher resonance positions, the column length is going to get larger. We also have open air columns. So an open air column is actually open at both ends. So what you do is you're, you take a, again, take a tuning fork, strike it. It's going to direct a, an instant wave in here. Now you might be like, well, how, how can it reflect to produce a standing wave? I'm not totally sure the explanation for this, but I suspect that the particles contained within the tube are probably a little bit in ter a little bit different in terms of density for the particles that are outside of the tube. So just going from the interior of the tube to the outside of the tube might be equivalent to going into a different type of medium. So some of that wave energy is actually going to reflect because it's almost like you're going into a different medium when you ex exit the tube. So it reflects back and you can get a standing wave. Now, the one thing you should notice here is that for an open air column, what you want to do is you want to get anti-nodes at both ends. So again, if we just draw our equilibrium position vertically, again, your stationary points, those are your nodes, N, and then the points where you have maximum amplification, that's where like the standing wave would be oscillating from like crest to trough, et cetera. That's an antinode. Okay, right here, another antinode. Right here, another antinode. So for an open air column, if you can cut the column length so that uh, you have an antinode at both the top end and the bottom end, then you're also going to produce that really, really loud sound. And that really loud sound will occur at our resonance positions. By the way, just going back to this one for a second, I think this is how like an organ is set up. I believe that like the, the air columns in the organ are like cut to certain lengths. 
just to like produce only the sounds at the resonance positions. Okay, so I, I've shown here like the, the first three column lengths that you could actually result in having an anti, anti note at both, uh, both the ends. And that's how we define an open error column. An open error column has an anti note, or first of all, it's open at both ends and it has an anti note at both ends. And if you can get an anti note at both ends, then you're going to, you're going to get the red, you're going to be at that resonance position, the resonance position where you get the super loud sound. I shouldn't say super loud sound, but a very distinct loud sound where otherwise you would not. Okay, so the resonance column length is related to the wavelength. Again, you could just draw pictures to figure out uh, the first three resonance positions where you must have an anti note at both the uh, both open ends. We can calculate it mathematically by this. So you have L is equal to N lambda divided by two. And again, very easy one to, to plug numbers in and confirm here. If N is one, then it would just be L equals lambda divided by two. So that is confirmed. Uh, I should point out that uh, this equation, number six, this equation five, uh, what else we got here? Uh, this equation for speed, I believe they're all on the additional formula sheet. I don't think I include the number of beats equation, but that's not really that difficult to calculate. All right, so that's it for this lesson. And you can complete the, okay, ignore the first point, because obviously you're not going to complete the speed of sound in error lab, but you can complete the assignment that is called resonance in error columns. And then the next lesson, we're going to finish the unit on mechanical waves and for regular physics 20 by talking about the Doppler effect. And I will talk to you then.